the tobacco interests. Now, the basic argument that e-cigarettes are a good thing and the argument that the tobacco companies use to try to promote them is they say there's no fire. You know, the way a cigarette works is you set the tobacco on fire to generate an aerosol of nicotine and ultrafine particles. And that aerosol carries the nicotine deep into your lungs where it's rapidly absorbed and quickly gets to your brain and, and you get a hard nicotine hit in your brain. And the, the one of the problems that's been recognized for a very long time with cigarettes is because of the fire, because of the combustion, there are a lot of toxic combustion products that, that are generated in order to generate that nicotine aerosol. As I'll explain in a minute, an e-cigarette generates a similar aerosol, but without setting anything on fire. And so the argument is that by avoiding the combustion, by avoiding the fire, you don't get the combustion products, and that makes e-cigarettes safer than cigarettes and uh, a safer alternative to cigarettes. And this is something that's heavily promoted by big tobacco. And the point is, that, as I'm going to show you, this is a very, very oversimplified argument. And the reality is, is much different. Now, the other thing you need to do when you're listening to the e-cigarette discussions is you really need to carefully consider the source. You need to carefully consider where you're getting your information from. And this is from a paper published recently in the uh, by the Pan American uh, Health Organization. And these investigators compared um, uh, the, the conclusions in papers about e-cigarettes, were they favorable or unfavorable to e-cigarettes based on who supported them or the connections with the, um, the the, with, uh, for the people who wrote the paper. And not surprisingly, they found that if the authors were in any way affiliated with the tobacco industry, the odds of them coming up with favorable conclusions for e-cigarettes were about 30 times higher than if they if they weren't affiliated with big tobacco. So the tobacco industry, anything connected with tobacco is highly suspect. And interestingly, they also found the same thing for people who are associated with pharma. It was a much smaller effect, but papers written by people tied into pharma were about three times more likely to uh, be favorable to e-cigarettes than, uh, than papers that weren't. So any kind of paper from anybody with even an indirect association with the tobacco industry or other industry, you need to really be suspect about whether or not you can rely on them. But the other very interesting thing they found is they looked at where the authors of the paper worked. And they found that papers from England had over twice the odds of a positive result for e-cigarettes compared to papers from anywhere else in the world. And England is a real hotbed of e-cigarette advocacy among people in the health community. And, uh, you know, I think you really have to look at anything coming out of England very, very skeptically, because it's just systematically biased in favor of these cigarettes. Now, these are the myths that are broadly promoted about e-cigarettes, including by the tobacco industry, but also by some well-meaning but misguided people in the health community who just like the idea of e-cigarettes. They say it's an innovative technology developed to compete with the multinational tobacco companies and take business away from them. The second is that they help smokers quit by switching to e-cigarettes. Another myth is that they're substantially safer than cigarettes. And finally, they argue that they don't really appeal to kids or that, that not many kids are using them. And I'm going to go through and show you evidence that shows every one of these arguments or myths associated with these cigarettes is just wrong. 
Now, before I get on and talk about that, I just want to spend a minute on how e-cigarettes work in case there are people uh, listening who are not familiar with this. As I said earlier, the way an e-cigarette works is it generates an aerosol of ultrafine particles and nicotine for the user to inhale. But rather than generating it by combustion, you have an electronic device that has a battery and then there's a tank that has what, what's called e-liquid in it, which is a, usually a solution of propylene glycol, glycerin, flavorings, and nicotine. And then there's a wick, kind of like a candle wick, that is soaked in this uh, liquid, and it has a heater coil wrapped around it, sort of like a miniature heater coil in a toaster wrapped around the wick. And when you energize the e-cigarette, the heater coil heats up, heats the wick, which is soaked in the e-liquid, and that generates the aerosol that the smoker or that the user inhales. So there's no combustion, but uh, you still have ultrafine particles, you still have nicotine, and it turns out you just have a lot of other bad stuff, which is just different from what a cigarette generates. There are also heated tobacco products. Uh, the, the one that's gotten the most attention here in the United States and which I know is, is being pushed to get into Brazil is something called ICOS made by Philip Morris International. The BAT also and Japan Tobacco have similar devices. The way I think of these heated tobacco products is it's kind of like a solid e-cigarette. You have, like an e-cigarette, you have a battery, you have some controlling electronics, but instead of a, liquid, a, a chamber filled with liquid, you have a like little mini cigarette, which is made out of ground up tobacco, essentially soaked in uh, propylene glycol, glycerin, flavorings and the like. And then there's a, a, a heater rod that pierces the tobacco stick. And when you activate the device, the heater rod gets very hot, and that's what generates the aerosol. So, I mean, there, there may be some combustion. There's a lot of arguing about that, but it, the basic idea is that it runs at a much lower temperature than a cigarette, so you don't get, at, at the very least, as much bad combustion products. Now, e-cigarettes e were pretty much like I just described, and uh, a few years ago, there was a tremendously important innovation by a company called Juul, which is actually based here in San Francisco. And this was a wildly successful e-cigarette. It was an independent company that, that positioned itself as competing with Big Tobacco, although a few years ago, Philip Morris bought a, a, a substantial share of Juul. But you can see the Juul device doesn't look like a cigarette. And in fact, that's one of the big innovations. Before Juul came along, most e-cigarettes were designed to kind of look like a cigarette to varying degrees because they were viewed as sort of a replacement. But Juul came up with the idea that they wanted something that looked modern and cool. And a, kids in particular, young adults, don't like cigarettes. So they came up with something that kind of looks like a flash drive. The blue part is the battery and the electronics. The black element on the right is um, it's called a pod. It has the chamber with the e-liquid in it, the heater coil, and um, that's the part you put in your mouth and suck on. And those come in various flavors. And when you consumed all the nicotine liquid, you throw away the pot and get another one. Now, Juul has been wildly successful, and there are several reasons for that. One, as I said, is the, is, is the product itself. It was a, it's a very innovative, good-looking design that appealed to a lot of people as being very modern. The second thing was that they had very, very clever marketing and, and using social media directed at young adults, which trickled down to teenagers. 
But another tremendously important innovation in Juul was they started to use what's called protonated nicotine. And the reason it's called protonated nicotine is you add an extra proton to the nicotine molecule. The picture on the, on the left is a conventional tank style e-cigarette like the one I used to describe how they work. And the nicotine in the e-liquid is free base nicotine like a cigarette. Uh, it's very uh, alkaline. It's very irritating to the throat. And so like with cigarette smoke, it's hard to inhale and there's a limit to how much of it you can get down at a puff without gagging. What the people who invented Juul came up with was putting a little bit of acid, they use benzoic acid into the e-liquid to add that extra proton to the nicotine molecule, which brings the acidity down to a, a more neutral pH. You get a smoother throat hit, it's much easier to inhale and so they can deliver a much higher effective dose of nicotine at a time in a Juul than a conventional e-cigarette. And this was, uh, you can see this if you look at, uh, at blood nicotine over time. The black area is looking at the level of blood, or pardon me, nicotine in your blood after starting to smoke a cigarette. And you can see that you get a very rapid rise in the nicotine concentration in your blood and you get a hard hit. This goes to your brain very quickly and it's very stimulating. If you look at the blue graph, you can see with a conventional free base nicotine e-cigarette, you, you don't get nearly as big a hit of nicotine, and it also develops much more slowly, which is much less supportive of nicotine addiction. And the e-cigarette, or the Juul, the original Juul, and the later ones even were more effective than this, um, you can see in the yellow mimics a cigarette. And this is actually from the Juul patent, and I think one of the, the reasons that Juul has been so successful is because they came up with this much more effective way to deliver nicotine to the brain. Now, since then, almost all the e-cigarette and heated tobacco product companies have copied this and gone to putting a little bit of acid in the e-liquid to get protonated nicotine. And you can see that the, the, the product design combined with the marketing, combined with the more uh, effective dose of delivery of nicotine had a real effect in terms of market share. And this is looking at the e-cigarette market in the United States from 2014 to 2018. And the red line is Juul and you can, and the other ones are the other companies, British American Tobacco, uh, MO is Marlboro, Blue, Logic, and Enjoy were. Uh, Logic, I think, is uh, Japan Tobacco. But you can see that the Juul just took off and just dominated the market. Now, since other companies have copied the Juul protonated nicotine idea, uh, they've actually been taking market share away from Juul. But overall, e-cigarette use has been dramatically increased by this more addictive form of nicotine. So that's all kind of background on the technology itself. So let's go through the, the four myths. The first one is that e-cigarettes are an innovative technology developed to compete with the multinational companies. And that certainly was the case originally for Juul and some of the other, and the other brands that initially started appearing in the market, uh, like Enjoy and Blue, um, uh, were independent companies in the beginning. But the market has really changed with the multinational. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. But the fact is that um, that the big tobacco companies had actually developed functional e-cigarettes in the mid 90s, about 10 years before they started being marketed by others. 
And the reason that these companies developed these e-cigarettes was not to help people quit smoking. It was not to reduce the risk associated with their use. It, it was developed to appeal to health concerned smokers who might quit. The major tobacco companies' marketing research in the late 1980s was showing a lot of smokers were, were quitting because they were health concerned. And so both Philip Morris and British American Tobacco and probably others worked on developing a system that might appeal to health concerned smokers. And that led both to the liquid e-cigarettes and the solid e-cigarettes like Icos. And this picture here is from internal tobacco industry documents showing that by the mid 90s, Philip Morris had a functional e-cigarette, very similar to the e-cigarettes that came on the market around 2005 or six from other sources. But they chose not to take them to market in the mid 90s because of political and legal concerns. But it's really important to understand that what the tobacco companies develop these products, not for harm reduction, not to help people get off cigarettes, but to hold on to customers. And today, the market has really changed. And pretty much all of the e-cigarettes, at least the e-cigarettes in the, in the, in outside of China, are all controlled or owned by the big multinational tobacco companies. And so what the evidence actually shows is that e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products were, were an innovative technology developed by the multinational tobacco companies to keep customers, not for harm reduction or smoking cessation. Now, the next myth that you hear all the time, and this is heavily promoted by the industry's efforts to get into markets like Brazil, where e-cigarettes are currently not allowed, is that they help smokers quit, that smokers will switch from cigarettes to e-cigarettes because it's a, just a better way to get nicotine. Now, when you're assessing the evidence linking e-cigarette use to quitting, it's really important to keep in mind that there are actually two different standards that apply and apply in different situations. The first is if you use e-cigarettes as a cessation medicine with supervised use, that is as a clinical intervention, as a form of inhaled nicotine replacement therapy. And the best way to test whether or not e-cigarettes work to increase cessation, whether they have efficacy as a cessation medicine, is a randomized clinical trial. And the, the standard, which is used by regulatory agencies like Anvista or, or, or the US FDA, is are they safe and effective? As far as I know, there isn't a single e-cigarette on the market anywhere in the world which has been approved by drug authorities as a safe and effective smoking cessation medicine. E-cigarettes are rather a consumer product. In the countries where they're legally available, anybody who is of appropriate age can just go buy them. There's no need, there's no prescription, there's no supervised use, and people are just buying whatever they're buying and using them however they're using. And so the, the real way to assess what effect e-cigarettes as consumer products have on smoking cessation is population level observational studies where you just simply compare the smoking behavior of people who use e-cigarettes with people who don't, with smokers who use e-cigarettes with smokers who don't. Now, the first really good randomized clinical trial of e-cigarettes as a clinical intervention is this paper by Peter Hajak published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few weeks ago, or pardon me, a few years ago. It's important, and, and this study found e-cigarettes had efficacy for increasing the chances a smoker would stop smoking. So this got a lot of press. 
it's still widely quoted and the industry and others use it heavily. And it's important to say that as a randomized clinical trial, you know, it was actually pretty well done. But we're not looking at e-cigarettes as used in the population. We're looking at a clinical intervention among people who wanted to quit smoking. The e-cigarette use was combined with four weeks of intensive smoking cessation counseling. And so what this study was measuring is not how e-cigarette, whether e-cigarettes help smokers quit when they're buying them as a consumer product, but rather their efficacy is a clinical intervention and they had efficacy. But another important thing to look at is if you looked at the people a year later who were randomized into the e-cigarette group, 80% of them were still using e-cigarettes a year later versus 9% for nicotine replacement therapy. And so you, you're simply switching people from be, of, of the people that quit cigarettes, you're just shifting them to another form of inhaled nicotine, which as I'll show you brings a lot of problems. But if you look at the clinical trials, and this is from a meta-analysis we published a couple of years ago, where we located eight, or pardon me, nine randomized clinical trials. Here's the HAJAC one is the second one. And for, the, to, for those of you who are not familiar with how you read a graph like this, I'd like to just take a minute and, and walk you through it. The, what, what you do in a clinical trial like this is you estimate something called the relative risk. The relative risk is essentially the probability that someone will stop smoking if they use these cigarettes divided by the probability that someone will stop smoking without using these cigarettes. If e-cigarettes help people quit smoking, e-cigarettes as a, a, as a medicine help people quit smoking, the relative risk will be above one. If e-cigarettes make it harder to quit, the relative risk will be below one. If e-cigarettes don't have any effect one way or the other, on the likelihood that someone will stop smoking, the relative risk is one, which is the vertical line in the middle of the graph. Now for each study, you'll see there's a, a dot with a little box around it. That's the, the, what's called the point estimate. That's the, the, the relative risk estimated in the study. And the horizontal line is what's called the 95% confidence interval, which a lot of people call the margin of error. And that's, that's the range in which you, the, the true relative risk is likely to lie uh, after you take into account statistical uncertainty. And here you can see, for example, the HAJAC study had a relative risk of 1.83. So it almost doubled the, the odd or the risk or the chance of somebody would have quit smoking. And the 95% confidence interval doesn't include one. So that was a statistically significant increase in quitting. When you do a meta-analysis, you pull all the individual studies because you can see, you know, some of them, the the confidence intervals included one, so the results weren't statistically significant. And one of the studies, the e-cigarette users actually quit less, although not significantly less. And when you put them all together and, and essentially average them, you find that overall e-cigarettes as a clinical intervention had a 1.56 relative risk of uh, people quitting smoking, which, which was statistically significant. And it means as a clinical intervention, com, you know, in, in a supervised environment, they do have efficacy for helping people quit smoking. Now, whether or not they have a favorable risk benefit ratio, which is the other thing that drug authorities look at is a, is an additional question because you have to consider the risks associated with using them too. But I think that evidence is pretty clear that as a clinical intervention, they do have efficacy. But 
the thing that's much more important in terms of e-cigarettes is are actually out there in the real world is what the population studies show. And as you can see, there are many, many more population studies than there are clinical trials. And if you look at them overall, you see that e-cigarettes compared to cigarettes don't help people quit smoking. The the night the a 95% confidence interval for the um, uh, for the uh, um, the effect, at, which is the little the little diamond at the bottom, includes one, and so e-cigarettes don't help people quit smoking used as consumer products, and that's very important because. The whole argument for e-cigarettes as a harm reduction assumes that they'll help people quit smoking, and they don't. Finally, if you look at the, at the studies that we considered in our meta-analysis, and there have been a couple more meta-analyses published since then that, uh, that brought newer studies in, You'll see that most of the studies had relatively short follow-ups, usually somewhere between a month and six months. In the last few months, about six months or, or so ago, there were two major studies published that followed people for three years. So they looked at the long-term effects of e-cigarettes on smoking cessation. And what you can see in these two studies is that the relative risk ratio or the or the risk difference, they use different measures, but they're essentially the same thing. We're down around 0.3. And so what and highly significant. And what this means is that e-cigarette user use is not only not helping smokers quit over the long term, it's making it harder to quit and promoting smoking and continued smoking. And if you're a cigarette company, that's exactly what you would like. You would like to see people start using e-cigarettes because they think they'll help them quit smoking. But in fact, it keeps them smoking so you can keep selling them cigarettes. And if you're still selling them e-cigarettes at the same time, that's even better. You know, you're making even more money. So what the evidence actually shows is that as consumer products, e-cigarettes don't help smokers quit and probably actually prevent quitting. The next really important myth is that e-cigarettes are substantially safer than cigarettes. And, you know, the argument there, as I said, is that, um, uh, that if you... Um, that you don't have combustion, you don't have all the combustion products, and so uh, that's got to be better. And there are a lot of studies looking at so-called biomarkers where they look at the levels of certain bad chemicals in the blood of e-cigarette users compared to smokers, and they, they almost always show lower levels of these bad chemicals in the e-cigarette users. So, so that's an argument that people use to say, well, e-cigarettes... Uh, you know, have to be causing less disease, but I'm going to show you that's not true. Now, one claim, oh, wait, let me make sure, yeah. So one claim that's been, you hear loudly, that's been around for a very long time, and especially emanating from England, is that e-cigarettes are 95% safer than cigarettes. And this is repeated over and over and over again. But if you dig and look backwards through the literature, the place that number came from is this paper, Estimating the Harms of Nicotine-Containing Products by a guy named David Nutt and others. And they conclude that e-cigarettes are 95% safer than cigarettes. The problem is that that this is not based on any hard evidence whatsoever. And in fact, the paper recognizes that. They say the lack of hard evidence for most of the harms of the product on most criteria. So they, this was not be based on some data. And, and it was just a group of people who got together and sort of scratched their behinds and looked at the ceiling and decided e-cigarettes are 95% safer than cigarettes. 
The paper also admits there was no criteria for recruitment of the experts. But if you look at the people who were recruited, it's a who's who of people who think e-cigarettes are a good idea. And the most important thing is there is no actual empirical evidence at all cited. This is just a made up number. Furthermore, as this article in the Daily Mail in England pointed out, and also articles in, in the British Medical Journal and The Lancet, is a lot of the people participating in this paper had undisclosed connections and conflicts of interest with the tobacco industry. So this is, I, this, the fact that this number is still floating around out there is just a testament to the tobacco company's PR machine and some questionable ethics on the part of the people who keep promoting it who should know better. Now, the first really big review by a credible outside body looking at e-cigarettes was this report written in 2018 by the National Academy of Medicine in the United States. And uh, it, it drew many conclusions, but a couple of the important ones were across a range of studies and outcomes, e-cigarettes pose less risk than an individual in combustible cigarettes. But that's solely based on the lower levels of some biomarkers. And they also said, and this is very important, implications for long-term effects on morbidity and mortality, that is on actual disease, are not yet clear. And this report makes the point that at the time they were writing it, there weren't any studies looking at actual disease outcomes working with these cigarettes. And that statement was true in 2018 when this report was written. But we know a lot more today than we did in 2018. So what do we know about e-cigarettes? and their health effects. And there's a large literature in this area now, but the first thing is, as I mentioned, e-cigarettes create an aerosol of ultrafine particles, just like cigarettes do you carry the nicotine down into the lungs. And this is a, a picture of the particle size distribution for e-cigarettes. So it's the number of particles divide or, or, or the vertical axis and how big they are on the horizontal axis. And notice that's a log scale. And compared to conventional cigarettes. And what you can see is that the e-cigarettes are actually generating more particles and they're smaller than in cigarettes. And these ultrafine particles are very small. If you look at the picture, that's a human hair. And the little blue, um, uh, the, the little red, dots here are pictures the size of ultrafine particles. So the yellow balls are like dust. Fine particles, less than two and a half, two and a half microns in diameter are the blue ones and the ultrafine particles under 100 nanometers, which is this peak where the peak is for the e-cigarettes are really tiny and they're so small they can go right through blood vessels right through cell membranes and into the body and they create all kinds of problems they trigger inflammatory processes they uh, do all kinds of bad things another thing that's very important is when you're looking at the effect of particles on uh, many diseases, and this is for heart disease, there's a very highly nonlinear dose response curve. Now, this is for data about smoking and secondhand smoke. But you can see that as, as the particle size, or pardon me, as the dose of ultrafine particles goes up, the risk associated for heart disease goes up very, very fast at low levels. And then it continues to increase with higher exposures, but the rate of increase slows down. So a little bit of exposure to these ultrafine particles is really bad. Now, one of the many things that these particles do is they interfere with normal blood vessel function. And your arteries are constantly adjusting for how adjusting how big they are. Uh, when you're just sitting here listening to my me talk, uh, 
you're, you don't need a lot of blood flow. Your arteries are relatively small in order to maintain your blood pressure in the face of low blood flow. When you get up and run out of the room, you start needing a lot more oxygen to, to your muscles and other organs, and they're generating waste products that need to be carried away. And your arteries actually dilate. They get bigger to accommodate the increased flow. And that's something called FMD, flow-mediated dilation. And you can measure flow-mediated dilation in people and animals with a fairly straightforward experiment. In people, what you do is you put a blood pressure cuff on their arm, you clamp it down for a few minutes, and so your lower arm gets deprived of oxygen and develops what's called ischemia. And then when you release the blood pressure cuff, the blood rushes into your arm to compensate for the lack of flow and your blood vessels dilate because the flow stimulates the, the, the cells to get bigger or not the cells, the blood vessels to get bigger. And so this is the first experiment looking at this in e-cigarettes in people. And what they did, they took non-smokers and they measured the flow-mediated dilation. And it was around 7.5%, which is a typical value. They then either had them smoke at one tobacco cigarette, which is the blue, blue bar, or one e-cigarette, which is the the maroon color. And what you see is two important things. There was an, an immediate drop in the amount of dilation in the arteries that got cut almost in half. And the e-cigarettes and cigarettes weren't that different. If you then do the same experiment in smokers, before you've had them smoke a cigarette or an e-cigarette acutely, you see that their FMD, their flow-mediated dilation, is lower than the non-smokers. It's down between 5 and 6%, which is one of the chronic bad things smoking does. And then when they expose, have them either smoke a cigarette or use an e-cigarette, you get an additional drop in, in flow-mediated dilation and the ability of the arteries to get bigger. And again, it happens immediately, and it's a substantial effect. And compromised FMD both predicts future heart disease, and it's very heavily tied up in the response to a heart attack if you have, if you have a heart attack. So this is really bad. Now, my colleague at UCSF, Matt Springer, has figured out a way to do these experiments in, uh, in animals, uh, in, in rats. And this is a study he published uh, a couple, a few years ago, where he measured FMD in rats exposed to Juul, earlier generation e-cigarettes, Marlboro cigarettes, and air. Where, and I'm going to start with the air, which is the picture all the way on the, on the right. And you can see that the amount of flow-mediated dilation in these arteries of these rats was essentially unchanged before and after they had a period of them breathing air, which is what you would expect. If you look at Juul, you can see that the FMD before they were exposed to the Juul aerosol well, it was averaged around 7%, 7 or 8%, which is what we talked about before. And then after they exposed them to Juul for a few minutes, it was cut way down to about 4%. And if you look at, you see the same thing in earlier generation e-cigarettes. And if you look at, at, at animals exposed to the smoke, from a Marlboro cigarette, a conventional combusted cigarette, you'll see the effects are essentially the same as for a jewel. So in terms of these uh, immediate substantial effects on blood vessel function, e-cigarettes are no different from cigarettes. Now, that and a lot of other biological evidence I don't have time to get into uh, would lead you to think that you, people who use these cigarettes have an increased risk of heart attacks. 
And this is the first study looking at the association between e-cigarette use and the risk of heart attacks. This is a paper we did using something called the National Health Interview Survey here in the United States, which is a gigantic population level survey that the government does. And a, a, again, a, a risk of one, oh, this dotted line is in the wrong place on this slide, I'm sorry, it should be of one, which is no, no, in, no risk associated, associated with e-cigarette use. And if you just look at the at the last pair of bars, you'll see that the daily e-cigarette users had about a doubling of their risk of having had a heart attack, uh, which is not significantly different from the increase in smokers. And likewise, the same thing is true for non-daily smokers. You get a significant increase in risk, non-daily e-cigarette users, I mean, you get a significant increase in risk and it, you can't see the uh, error bars here, but it's not significantly different from cigarettes. Likewise, and there's lots of other things that I don't have time to talk about. Likewise, there's lots of reasons to think e-cigarettes are bad for your lungs. The liquid base, the propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin, if you inhale that is uh, bad for your lungs. The tobacco and the nicotine itself is bad for your lungs. A lot of the flavoring agents, particularly one called diacetyl, which is used to, for butter flavoring, uh, damages your lungs. A lot of other flavoring agents like cinnamon and coconut, or pardon me, cocoa, which are fine to eat, but if you aerosolize them and breathe them in there, they really tear up your lungs. The coil, and here you can see the, the wick with the coil wrapped around it. The coil, uh, and it's a metal coil, that boils off heavy metals, which you take into your lungs, and that's bad. And then the wick itself, over time, decomposes, and little bits of wick flick off and get caught down in your lungs. So all of that would make, would, would, are good reasons to think e-cigarettes would be associated with lung disease. And this is a meta-analysis we did uh, last summer. It was a preliminary analysis where we, we have more data, but it isn't published yet. But this is 60 from 61 studies that we found looking at actual the association between e-cigarette use and actual disease endpoints. And this is, was was included in a public comment that we submitted to the FDA on a pending regulation. The link is at the bottom. And you can see that for cardiovascular disease, e-cigarettes are associated with about a 1.3 risk. For asthma, about a 30% increase in risk. For COPD, about a 60% increase in risk. And we also found a bunch of data on oral diseases uh, which was uh, mostly periodontitis, periodontal disease, also 1.6. We found, not surprisingly, elevations in risks associated with smoking. And interestingly, for dual use, which is people using e-cigarettes and cigarettes at the same time, which is a very common pattern among adults, there were also increases in risk that were actually bigger than the risks for smoking or e-cigarettes alone. But in fact, when you're talking about the harm reduction question, the, the, the comparison of most policy interest is not e-cigarettes against not using e-cigarettes because you know, no, I don't think anybody, even the e-cigarette enthusiast, claims that they're harmless. They just say they're not as bad as cigarettes. And so really what you want to do is compare e-cigarettes with cigarettes. And also you want to compare dual use with cigarettes because dual use is a very, very common pattern of use. The very few studies actually report these comparisons, but it's possible to, to compute them based on uh, published results. And so this is what we found in this preliminary analysis of 61 studies. 
We looked at cardiovascular disease, asthma, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and oral disease. And there were a few other outcomes that people had looked at that we didn't pool. And what we found comparing e-cigarette risk to cigarette risk is for cardiovascular disease and for, for oral diseases, there's not a significant difference between cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So in terms of harm reduction for those outcomes, e-cigarettes are not detectably different from cigarettes in terms of actual disease risk, regardless of what the biomarkers show. We did find lower risk for asthma and for COPD. For asthma, it was about e-cigarettes are about 80% as bad as cigarettes. For COPD, they're about half as bad as cigarettes. When, but these numbers, even those reduced risk estimates are still way above the 95% safer number that you hear e-cigarette advocates uh, claiming. If you look at dual use compared to smoking, for every single one of the outcomes, dual use was worse than smoking. So if someone comes to you and, and, and says, I'm gonna switch from an e-cigarette to a cigarette, what good is that gonna do me? I think you would say, well, it may be lowering your risk a little bit for some lung diseases, it's not going to affect your risk for heart disease and uh, periodontal disease and, and dental disease if you completely switch. But uh, depending on when you look and what country you look at, somewhere between 40 and 80 percent of adult e-cigarette users are dual users. And so because there are so many dual users, the overall net population risk actually goes up because dual use is always more dangerous than just smoking. Now, what about cancer? Okay, there's not a lot of data on cancer yet. Unlike heart disease and lung disease and, and oral diseases, it takes a long time for cancer to be manifest. But there are some interesting studies out there, and I'm going to just show you two of them. This is a study where people took cheek swabs, that is, scraped a few cells off the inside of people's cheeks in their mouths, and looked at, at genes related to cancer. Now, the cells on the inside of your mouth turn over very, very quickly. They're constantly being regenerated because your mouth, you know, there's a lot of wear and tear in your mouth. And, and the cells that you have in your cheeks today are, all, are pretty much all different than the cells you had a month or six weeks ago. And so these investigators took advantage of that fact and they looked at cheek cell at genes, cancer related genes and cheek cells on people who are smoking cigarettes and people who are sole e-cigarette users and taking advantage of the fact that, you know, it didn't really matter if people used to smoke if they'd stopped and switched completely to e-cigarettes more than a month or two ago, the cigarette effect is gone. And what they found was that there are a lot of genes, 853, that are affected just by e-cigarettes plus 299. So there's about 12, 11 or 1,200 genes adversely affected for cancer by e-cigarettes. Among smokers, there's more genes adversely affected, about uh, 17 or 1,800. But the difference is not that big. E-cigarettes are still having a substantial effect on genes related to cancer. And to me, the most interesting thing about this finding is they're mostly different. So looking for smoking-induced cancers may not be the right way to analyze e-cigarettes because most of the genes that are affected are different. Furthermore, there have been experimental studies where they were able to cause cancer in mice by taking mice, exposing them to e-cigarettes for, for 54 weeks. And they found increased lung cancers, um, precancerous changes in the bladder, uh, 
And these are experiments there. You don't have to worry about confounding variables or anything like that. And so this is exactly consistent with what you would expect based on the other study. And there are also studies showing that e-cigarettes interfere with cancer chemotherapy. And finally, e-cigarettes pollute the air, just like cigarette smoke. It's, there's not as much of it. There's not a, a lot of data on actual health effects of secondhand e-cigarette aerosol, but there are several studies documenting that bystanders who are non-e-cigarette users absorb nicotine out of the air when people are using e-cigarettes around them. And then, interestingly, they end up with sort of similar levels of nicotine as bystanders around cigarette smoke. Hmm. So the evidence, if you look at what it actually shows, is that e-cigarettes are about as dangerous as cigarettes, especially when you take into account dual use. So they're not really reducing harm. Finally, there's the argument that they, they're really designed for adults uh, who are interested in quitting smoking or reducing harm related to smoking, and they won't appeal to kids. And, and that's absolutely not true. Oops. This is data from the United States from our, our National Youth Tobacco Survey. And you can see that the e-cigarette e use, which is the red line, has really taken off. And while it's lower than at its peak back in 2019 and much higher than cigarette smoking, it's the overall total number of kids using nicotine has been dramatically increased by e-cigarette use. And in fact, the prevalence of e-cigarette use among kids is way higher than it is in adults. And this is pretty much true in many, many countries. There's also what's called the gateway effect. And that is kids who start nicotine with e-cigarettes greatly increases the chances they'll go on and smoke cigarettes. And this is from a meta-analysis looking at international studies. And uh, what you can see if you pull all these studies or when they pulled all these studies, nicotine never smoking kids who start with e-cigarettes are about three times as likely to be smoking cigarettes later. So e-cigarettes are promoting cigarette use too, which again, if you're a cigarette company or a tobacco company, this is great. It allows you to expand the market by bringing in kids who are at low risk of initiating with nicotine use with cigarettes. And, you know, not only do you have them as customers, but a lot of them are going to go on and then start smoking cigarettes too. Another thing that's, that's very important is that the, e the age at which kids are using e-cigarettes, and this is in the United States, has been coming down. If you look at cigarettes, which is the orange dotted line, or cigars, which is the blue line, or smokeless tobacco, which is the gray line, you can see that over time, the, the age at which kids start using the product isn't changing that much. But if you look at e-cigarettes, it's coming down. Younger and younger kids are being drawn into the market. And they're also becoming heavier users, particularly after about 2014, uh, when, when Juul came on the market, or 2015 or so. And so you, what this graph is, is each bar is a different year, each colored bar. And you can see that in, in, in you know, go back, back in 2014, most kids were using e-cigarettes uh, one, you know, one time, once or twice a month. Uh, very few are using them very frequently, like more than 20 days or every day. If you jump forward to 2021, you'll see that the, the use has shifted to much heavier use with lots of kids using them 20 or more days a month and a lot of them using it every day. So they become more addicted. And this is following the advent of, of the Juul and the protonated nicotine technology. This is a direct measure of addiction among these kids, which is 
how, what fraction of the kids who use e-cigarettes use their first e-cigarette within five minutes of waking, which is a measure of addiction. And you can see that it was pretty low until the jewel really started penetrating the market and then it shot up and, and you have a substantial fraction of kids who are using e-cigarettes now heavily addicted. So what the evidence is actually showing is that e-cigarettes attract kids and are expanding the tobacco market. Now, e-cigarettes are uh, a, a great political boon for the industry too, which is presenting itself as the new kinder, gentler industry and that they're trying to promote smoking cessation and harm reduction with these new products like e-cigarettes and, and uh, heated products. But as I've shown you, those claims just aren't supported by the evidence. And in fact, if you go back into the 80s and look at why the companies developed these products in the first place, it was not to help people quit smoking or do harm reduction. It was to maintain the market, which is what's happened. There's a lot of specific values to the industry, which I'm sure you're hearing in Brazil, that they position themselves as being part of the solution, not part of the problem. They're trying to undermine the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, especially Article 5.3, which is supposed to insulate policymaking from the industry. They detract from and distract from work on effective tobacco control policies like clean indoor air, uh, getting smoking out of movies, tax increases, advertising restrictions. Uh, they've divided the health community and led to a lot of fighting because in addition to the usual suspects who essentially work for the industry, there are misguided people, particularly in England but also in many other countries, including the United States, who continue to ignore the evidence and think e-cigarettes are a good thing. And most important, they allow the industry to maintain and expand markets and protect its profits. So what's the situation today? Well, e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products are illegal in Brazil. There, it's, there are some there because the industry is good at sneaking past border restrictions, but um, they're illegal. I think that's a very good public policy. You've avoided most of the problems that e-cigarettes have created in other countries like the United States that allow them. And this is shown in, in the data in Brazil. Um, uh, two, as of 2019, 2.8% 2 of youth were using e-cigarettes. Uh, that's bad, but that's a tenth of what it is in the United States in the same year where 27.5% of high school students and 10% of middle students were using them. Furthermore, among adults, about a six tenths of a percent of, of people aged 15 or older are using these devices compared to 4.5% in the United States. So by maintaining these products as illegal and doing your best to keep them out of the country, you're really heading off the, the problems that places like the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and England have had by having favorable environments for these products. So what's the bottom line? Well, the first is the combustion is not as important as we thought it was. Um, the, the, the act of inhaling ultrafine particles and a lot of a lot of toxic chemicals, even though they're different toxic chemicals that often that a cigarette generates are bad. And for many diseases, e-cigarettes are just as bad as smoking. And for everything people have looked at, dual use is more dangerous than just smoking. And there are a lot of dual users. Second, as consumer products, e-cigarettes don't help smokers quit. You should not be recommending them for, for, for cessation. And they're probably displacing effective therapies that actually work and making it harder for people to quit smoking. There's rapid youth uptake in the places where they're legal which, and promoting progression to cigarettes. They pollute non-smokers air. They're expanding the tobacco epidemic and helping the tobacco industry. And so my strong advice to you 
is keep doing what you're doing. Maintain and support Brazil's ban on these products and keep them out. And there's around 40 or 50 countries around the world, by the way, which have such a policy. And in several of them that I've looked at, you see results similar to Brazil, where the levels of e-cigarette use among both youth and adults is way lower than it is in countries that permit them. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to hear any comments or take any questions. Thank you so much, Professor Glantz. Uh, I'm going to sound a little bit crazy right now, but I'm a psychiatrist, so I'm used to it. I'm going to have to present you again because you're just so important and uh, I can't let that pass blank. blank. And because it wasn't streaming at the beginning, I'm so sorry. É, então, gente, a gente está aqui no Dia Mundial Sem Tabaco com duas pessoas é, de currículo muito impressionante, referências internacionais. Né? O professor Glentz é um dos maiores ativistas do mundo. Hoje ele trouxe a palestra Cigarros Eletrônicos, Incremento de Danos e Proteção dos Interesses da Indústria no Mundo. Ele é professor ilustre de controle do tabaco da American Legacy Foundation e comandou por décadas a Center for Tobacco Control Research and Education que fez e faz muita diferença ainda para a saúde pública mundial. Outro convidado muito especial é o doutor André Luiz Oliveira da Silva, expert pro bono da Convenção Quadro, os artigos 9 e 10, referentes a conteúdos e emissões dos produtos do tabaco e pós-doutorando da Universidade de São Francisco. É, ele agora, convido você, André, para debater os principais pontos que o professor Glentes falou, com tanta informação importante, né? e depois a gente vai seguir para as perguntas. Então, obrigado pelo convite, Carolina. Só para complementar um pouquinho, sou servidor licenciado da Anvisa também, então esse evento foi ótimo no sentido de que a Anvisa tem recebido muita pressão em relação à proibição dos cigarros eletrônicos no Brasil. Então, vocês terem convidado o Dr. Glantz e eu vim aqui dessa pequenina contribuição perto do que ele veio trazendo aqui é muito, muito interessante. E... E realmente o, o que foi apresentado pelo Dr. Glentz é muito importante, porque são basicamente os tópicos que uh, as pessoas que defendem o, o, os, os cigarros eletrônicos, no Brasil a gente chama de dispositivos eletrônicos para fumar, é uma categoria que abrange não só os cigarros eletrônicos, mas como os produtos de tabaco aquecido e os produtos híbridos. Então é, é muito impressionante como que basicamente a maioria dos argumentos, segundo o apresentado pelo Dr. Glentz, são mitos. São, são, são informações que não têm respaldo na, na, na literatura científica quando esmiuçados de maneira mais, mais detalhada. Então, realmente agradeço a BEAD né, pelo, pelo convite ao Dr. Glantz de trazer essa informação. Temos inúmeras questões feitas pelo público. Está é, bem, bem interessante. Eu vou falar em inglês agora para o professor Glantz nos entender. Professor Glantz, we have a plenty of the questions. The people are really, really excited and very, very thankful for your presentation. Thank you so much for being here with us. So we have lots of questions. Let me see where did the questions began, because uh, the people are really, really excited. And the first question, Dr. Glantz, is an people really like that you talk about the distribution by the England government of the electronic cigarettes and public health system. And people really love to, to hear you talk about the distribution of electronic cigarettes. Well, what, so the question is, what do I think about England and what they're doing? Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I think that, it, that it's just beyond irresponsible. Um, you know, if you go back 15 years, 18 years, when e-cigarettes first started to appear, the idea that an e-cigarette is a good idea from a public health and medical perspective is not crazy. You don't have the combustion. And the idea that it might be a safer form of nicotine inhalation, a, more, a better form of nicotine replacement therapy, 
Um, you know, it's not an unreasonable idea. You're delivering it by inhalation. You don't have the combustion. People didn't, you know, they thought it would just appeal to adults. Kids wouldn't care. All the myths that I started with. And if you go back in the beginning, those ideas, which were really driving thinking um, in England and other places, are, I mean, they're not crazy. They're not, you know, they're not on their face ridiculous. But the problem is, if you look at what actually happened, if you look at the evidence that has actually accumulated in the last 18 years, it just, none of those theories turned out to be right. I mean, there's lots of things in the real world and in medicine which seem like good ideas and turn out not to be. And my big complaint about the people in England is that their thinking is stuck in the past. They have simply refused to honestly look at the evidence. And if you look at the reports coming out of Public Health England and the British government and even the National Health Service, they represent selective readings of the literature. They, they spin the science rather than taking it at a face value. And they just have their, their feet dug in. I mean, I was, I mean, I have kind of part, there are people in England who are like not crazy and who are trying to do the right thing on these cigarettes, but they're in the distinct minority and they're basically being shouted down by the e-cigarette true believers. And I mean, just there's new statistics out of England from a couple of weeks ago that show huge problems with kids. And the, you know, the, the, the e people, I can't remember if it was Ann McNeil or Linda Bald, who are two of the key e-cigarette advocates in the health community in England, was saying like, well, maybe there's a problem with kids, but they come up with all these excuses like, well, they're not using them that much and they're not regular users. And they, I mean, they really remind me of the tobacco companies where rather than, you know, looking at the body of evidence, because there is no perfect study. You give me any study done by anybody, including me, and I'll find something wrong with it. But what you need to do in science is you need to look at the overall body of evidence and ask what explanations can possibly explain the overall evidence and, and what kind of picture emerges. And rather than honestly doing that, what they do is go through and nitpick every single study and find reasons to ignore the evidence, or they just ignore it on its face. And, you know, I think that the, 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 British, the British government and the health community in England are doing huge global damage because they are who the industry points to all over the world. And, um, you know, I, I just think they're doing this huge experiment on the population in England by promoting this very dangerous form of nicotine use and they're gonna they're killing a lot of people I mean of all the things they've done the craziest one is recommending e-cigarettes for pregnant women you know I mean if you look at just the vascular effects of e-cigarettes you know much less the fact that nicotine cause crosses the placenta and ends up in the developing brain of the newborn. You know, that's just, I just can't believe that they're, that they're doing that. So, you know, I've had a lot of people, I've had a lot of reporters said, what's wrong? Why are they doing it? And it's just like, I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of these people. I've been friends with a lot of them for years. And I just think it's like they've been, their brains have been captured by space aliens. But I think, I think the thing that is important for the rest of the world, and Brazil is one of the leaders in terms of dealing with these problems, is to just keep following the science and recognize this is an area which is developed, where things are developing very, very fast. If you look at the 2018 National Academy, uh, National Academy of Sciences report, you know, which, as I said, at the time it was written, it, it, it's a very good piece of work.
but two thirds to three quarters, maybe even more of the scientific literature on e-cigarettes was published after that report was written. And it's, and it's very important to stay on top of, what, of what's going on. As I said, in 2018, there wasn't a single population level epidemiological study about e-cigarettes and, and actual disease endpoints. And now there's well over a hundred of them. Thank you so much, Professor. And in the same line, I, I, I try to, to, to organize the questions to, mm -hmm. to, to, to give some, some organization. And we received another question, Professor Glantz, about the Crocker systematic review about the electronic cigarettes and cessation. Yeah. I think it could be interesting give some comments about this study. Sure, sure. Well, the Cochrane Review, the, 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 what the Cochrane Review, well, the Cochrane system is set up to assess clinical interventions. And if you look at the studies that are included in the Cochrane Review, they're more or less the same studies that we included in our review and meta-analysis of the randomized controlled trials. And they found the same thing we found. And that is as a medicine, you know, as something delivered as a clinical intervention, there's evidence of efficacy for e-cigarettes. You know, if you go look at the numbers in the Cochrane Review, it's not that different than what we found. The problem with the Cochrane Review is that it is represented as evidence that e-cigarettes as consumer products help people quit smoking, and they don't. And I've actually had long discussions, I'm blanking on her name, uh, the woman who's in charge of the Cochrane Review, her name is Hartman, Dr. Hartman Voice, and she understands that. She knows that the Cochrane methodology applies to randomized trials which apply to clinical interventions. And if you dig really deep in what they write, they recognize that. But they, which I think is all fine as far as it goes, but I think it's the height of irresponsibility. And this is, I'm not telling you anything I haven't told them. For them to not be out there making that point very strongly. And and, and they just let the Cochrane reviews be represented as saying e-cigarettes as consumer products help people quit smoking. And that's not what they show. And most of the evidence is not the randomized trials. It's the observational studies in the population. And those are, as I said, very consistent of showing no cessation benefit. And in fact, the two most recent, biggest, longest term ones show harm. And there are other studies that show increases in relapse among former smokers, too, that I haven't talked about. So, you know, I think if an e-cigarette company or a tobacco company, because they're all essentially owned by tobacco companies now, wanted to promote e-cigarettes as a prescription medication for smoking cessation in a clinical environment, let them. You know, let them put it into Envista, let them put it into the FDA, to the drug side of those agencies, and try to make the case that they're effective and safe. That's the criteria for looking at medicines. Now, I think, you know, that, that they've shown efficacy, that, you know, they are a form of nicotine replacement therapy that in a clinical environment increases cessation. Now, I think they're, and that's what the Cochrane Review shows, too. But the other side of that is what about the risks? And, you know, the HAJAC study and there have been others have shown that people who are randomized into the e-cigarette group are, most of them are continuing to use it after the cessation trial. And given that you're increasing the risk of heart disease, you're increasing the risk of oral diseases, you're increasing their risks to, to a certain extent of pulmonary diseases, and there are others where there's more limited data, things having to do with metabolic syndrome and uh, complications of pregnancy and other things, um, where there's not enough data yet to do a formal analysis. But, you know, you look at the studies, and I seriously doubt 
that a regulatory agency, a drug regulatory agency, would authorize their use as smoking cessation medications, not because they lack efficacy, because I do think they have efficacy, but because of the safety profile, that, that the other currently approved therapies like nicotine replacement therapy and varenicline and propion, things like that, have efficacy with much lower level of, of long-term risks. But again, why, if that's true, you know, why haven't any of these companies submitted these things to the, to the regulatory authorities? And there's, I mean, maybe they have, but there's not a single country in the world in which e-cigarettes are authorized for use as a medical intervention. And that's what the, if you, that's the whole Cochrane Collaborative was created to assess clinical interventions, not consumer products. Perfeito. É, I, quer hope my, Andrea? I hope my answers aren't too long. No, no, just perfect. perfect. Yeah, Carolina seems to be enjoying them. Uh, eu vou fazer em português e aí você fala com ele. Os documentos internos da indústria foram um marco. Como podemos reivindicar que as pesquisas internas sejam reveladas nos tempos de hoje, que não há papel? Tá no mudo, André. Precisa... Desculpa. Sorry. Sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't hear André there. So... No, I, I mute myself all time. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> é, Carolina asked about the... The tobacco industry documents are a milestone and... They, of course, they are extremely important for tobacco control, but she's concerned about the, in the paperless times, how you could deal with the, 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 the new types of communication, internal communication to, to, to acquire the information from manufacturers or the tobacco companies or electronic cigarette companies. I think it could be interesting to comment about the due case in the courts that the, the, the justice in the US um, Monday they do release the documents, so I, I think it could be interesting to comment about it, especially people are concerned about the we have no more paper and how to deal with the, 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 the paperless time. So if you could comment. Well, the, the, the industry documents which have been produced um, that are in the documents library today include a lot of electronic documents. You know, the the old documents were images of paper documents because that's what people had. But there, but there's a lot of stuff in there now. From I mean, the, there were the the cigarette companies were forced to continue producing documents into the uh, UCSF Truth Tobacco Documents Library until last year, and a lot of the material in there for the last few years is electronic. It's emails. It's spreadsheets. It's um, presentations, it's Word documents. So whether it's electronic or paper doesn't matter. Now, in the, there have been a series of settlements with Juul of, of the litigation here in the United States. And most of them require the documents that were produced by Juul in the litigation to be made public. And in fact, the first of the cases settled almost two years ago in North Carolina. And according to that, all of the documents were to have been released publicly by, I think it was last July, but they're not there. And, you know, what's happening is Jewel is just dragging its feet and the state attorneys general involved haven't you know, gone back into court to get them sanctioned and, and get them ordered to produce those documents. So, you know, there there are a lot of documents from Jewel and also Philip Morris, because Philip Morris owned part of Jewel, which are supposed to be made public, but they're just dragging their feet. And the the the, the key decision, this key settlement was North Carolina. And the attorney general's office in North Carolina, as far as I'm concerned, has just dropped the ball on it. You know, Jewel, the settlement gives Jewel too much control of, over the, re, the release schedule, although they violated it. And, you know, I, I think uh, 
the AG should have been by the long ago should have marched back into court and gotten an order from the judge telling Jewel to like release the stuff. But until and you know the, once the documents are made available, then I think my colleagues at UCSF are going to add them to the current collection, and they'll be searchable just like any other collection. But uh, you know. It's it's very frustrating. I've been been jumping up and down complaining about it, but you know I'm just a retired professor. I don't have any power. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Glenn. There is a question specific about the if you could comment about the risk of vaping and metabolic syndrome. The in. There's yeah, there, there, there are several studies from Korea, and one was just published from here in the United States a, a couple of weeks ago that show of, I don't that the vaping increases the risk of metabolic syndrome by I think it was about a fat about 1.2 or 1.3 times, and it also showed that dual, like every, these other things, dual use is worse than smoking. So I have a blog, which is profglance.com. And if you go to that, I think the paper on metabolic syndrome is either the most recent post or the one before that. There were two or three out of Japan, out of Korea. Um, but this big one from the United States have found essentially the same thing. And they looked both at overall diagnosis of metabolic syndrome and then also the components like hypertension and abnormal lipids and things like that thank you there's another question concerned the, the health effects of electronic cigarette it's about the gateway effect of the electronic cigarettes and illicit drugs could you make some comments about the relation of electronic cigarettes use and marijuana use or other drugs use? Yeah, there are a few studies looking at the connection between illicit drug use and e-cigarette use and what it shows, it's very similar to what the, the, the cigarette studies show, the e-cigarette cigarette studies show, that actually it goes in both directions. Kids who initiate nicotine use with e-cigarettes are at an increased risk of going on and using marijuana. And I think, I don't know, I know they, people have looked at marijuana. I can't remember about other drugs. And then also kids who initiate nicotine use with cigarettes are also more likely to add e-cigarettes and kids who use marijuana are, are more likely to add e-cigarettes. So it goes both ways. Yes, I, I remember I read something about the relation of electronic cigarettes and have cons alcohol consumption. I think there is some relation to alcohol consumption. Yeah, I yeah, I can't remember specific studies on that, but I think you're right. <laughs> you know, but if you, I mean, basically, the these, I mean, for example, you could vape marijuana too. There are marijuana e-cigarettes, and they they're different than the nicotine e-cigarettes because the solvents that are used are different because. <laughs> Nicotine is soluble in different things than, than THC is, but you know they are all there are all these crossover effects. But see, the important thing about the, the the gateway when you're talking about tobacco is is the gateway for between e-cigarettes and cigarettes. It's actually got as I've said two doors. One is the data that I show you, which is that kids who initiate nicotine use with e-cigarettes are about three times more likely to then go on and add cigarettes. So that's what a lot of people focus on. But there's another gateway effect too, and that is if you look at the risk profile of kids who initiate nicotine use with e-cigarettes, a substantial fraction of them, somewhere between one-third and two-thirds of them, have risk profiles that you look at and you say, this kid's never going to pick up a cigarette. And so what e-cigarettes have done is dramatically expanded the nicotine market by bringing in a lot of low-risk kids. And if you look at that graph I showed, just showing the, the prevalence of e-cigarette use among kids over time, 
you see that way more kids are using e-cigarettes than ever used cigarettes. And those are the low-risk kids which are being pulled into the market by e-cigarettes. And then some of them are adding cigarettes. But the fact is, and this is like another thing that comes out of people in England and the e-cigarette advocates here in the United States that drive me nuts, is they say, well, it doesn't matter that they're smoking, they're using e-cigarettes because they're harmless. You know, it's keeping them from smoking cigarettes. And that's just not true. A, they're not harmless. You know, there's a lot of studies, for example, showing increased asthma among kids who use e-cigarettes. Psychosis. They're leading to their promoting cigarette smoking. Uma última pergunta, posso fazer? É, como você que... pode, Carolina, você pode. Muito obrigada. E aí depois eu vou convidar você, André, para fazer um fechamento, por favor, viu? Com tá. os pontos que você está estudando, que o professor Glantz trouxe. Né? e aí a gente fecha a live, infelizmente, vamos ter que te chamar para fazer, para conversar de novo, né? Porque falta muita pergunta ainda, tiveram muitas perguntas, muito obrigada, pessoal, e cada uma melhor que a outra. Então, outros produtos, por muito menos, saem do mercado, são cancelados e desacreditados, como as vacinas, por exemplo. O que acontece que os cigarros eletrônicos, cigarro convencional, tabaco aquecido, parecem imunes ao cancelamento? Professor Glenn, this question, it's a really, really, that, that's the very last question, but I think it's the most important question. It's uh, for, for, for to try to understand the, the, uh, the context of the, 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 not only electronic cigarettes, but even the, the, the regular cigarettes. The Carolina asked about if um, lots of products for much less are concealed cancel or remove it from the market. For example, even vaccines sometimes are disaccredited or removed it from the market or people get mad about vaccination. But products like electronic cigarettes and conventional cigarettes are very resilient. They are still in the market. And why it, it's happened? Why does those products seems to be immune to all efforts of the, the, the tobacco control policies and all efforts of the governments and regulators to to stop the, the, the addiction and the tobacco pandemic? Well, I think you're being too pessimistic. You know, they're not immune from anti-tobacco efforts. Just look at Brazil. You know, you have you you've had very aggressive tobacco control policies for a long time warning labels, restrictions on additives, um, keeping e-cigarettes and heated products and these other products off the legal market in Brazil. And if you look at the smoking rates, you have, and, and they're very low by global standards. You know, I got involved in this issue back in 1978, which was, you know, a long time ago. And at that point, the smoking prevalence here in, in California was about 25 or 30 percent. Okay. And if you, and today it's like eight or nine percent. And if you had come to me in 1978 and said, you're going to have an eight or nine percent smoking prevalence in California in 2023, you're going to have basically all public environments, including places like bars, smoke free. And smoking is going to just be socially unacceptable in most environments. I'd have told you you were nuts. I'd have told you it's just not possible. And I think if you look at what's happened here, where we've had a very aggressive anti-tobacco education program and a very strong anti-tobacco policy environment, there have been tremendous accomplishments over time. And if you, you know, we can't regulate the product here in California the way the FDA can and the way Avista can. But even with the limitations in the United States and even with the fact that the federal government is still dominated by big tobacco and a lot of the states are still dominated by big tobacco, we made a huge amount of progress. And, you know, why is, it, why is the problem even there at all? It's because there's the cigarette companies. They're huge, wealthy, aggressive, unethical companies who make their money killing people. You know, an ethical person would not work in the tobacco company.
you know, if you went back to the 40s or the 50s before there was broad understanding of the dangers of tobacco, I could see how like an ethical business person would say, we have a product, a lot of people like the product, let's go out there and sell it and make lots of money, okay? But as soon as people really came to appreciate how dangerous it is, anybody at all with any kind of ethical foundation would have gone off and done something else. And so if you look at the people who are running the multinational tobacco companies and their national allies, these are people who can sleep at night despite the fact that they're addicting kids and they're killing people, okay? And they're making a lot of money doing it. And, you know, one thing I always would tell my, my students and my fellows is if, if you want to work on tobacco, you know, it's hard. You have strong opposition. They're not nice people. They, I mean, they've gone after me repeatedly. They've gone after other people who, who, who are effective in this area. And from their point of view, it's completely logical because people like me, like Anvisto, like other effective tobacco, the parts of the WHO that work on tobacco, you know, they want to shut that down because, you know, every little public health victory we have, whether it's helping somebody quit smoking or preventing some kid from getting addicted to nicotine or passing a clean indoor air law, okay? We view those things as little public health victories. And every one of those victories is money straight out of the pockets of these giant corporations. And so they're going to do everything they can to use their power, to use their wealth, to use their political connections to protect their interests. And if you were running them, you know, you're all smart people and, and you decided, okay, I have no ethics. I'm going to go work for these guys. You do the same thing. So, you know, the, the only reason we have a tobacco problem today is the, is the wealth and the power and the lack of ethics of the tobacco companies and the fact that there are other people and organizations willing to play ball with them. But you should not, and I realize when you're in the trenches in these fights, it's very, very hard. I mean, you're up against a very powerful enemy. They're not nice people. And sometimes your friends and the people who should be your allies are all hiding under a rock somewhere. And progress always seems slow and, and frustrating. But I tell people the one advantage of being old, which I am, is I remember how things used to be. And, you know, I remember when you could smoke on airplanes. You know, you got in a metal tube and got shot across the country and getting asphyxiated, you know, and when I, when I would tell, when I tell that to young people today, they look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> you know, how can anybody smoke in an airplane, you know, and, and, you know, you can see the progress that's occurred. And I think what we need to do, what everyone needs to do is just keep pushing. And my key message to you in Brazil is you're doing well. You know, you're, you're, a lot of countries are looking up to Brazil. And that's why the industry is fighting so hard to beat you back. Because if they could beat back Brazil, boy, imagine what they could do somewhere else. And, but the advantage you have is you're actually in an environment where they're doing the right thing. Unlike a lot of what we have to deal with here in the United States. And, so whereas here I'm always telling people you need to get the government off, you need to get the FDA off its ass and they need to start actually doing something about e-cigarettes and they need to stop advocating the industry's harm reduction position and all that. In Brazil, it's a lot easier because you're just saying like, hooray for Envista, hooray for the government, you're doing the right thing, keep it up and just do more of it. So that's... Perfeito. André, uma última palavra. Então, obrigado, Carolina. Obrigado, Beade. Obrigado pelo convite. Obrigado por convidar o professor Glantz. Como você tinha perguntado, né, basicamente hoje, 
trabalhando na Anvisa, mas a pesquisa que eu, que eu realizei na Universidade da Califórnia, basicamente foi usar é, a utilização dos documentos internos da indústria para fortalecer a, o, o processo regulatório no mundo. E eu também tenho conseguido pesquisas sobre o efeito dos aditivos é, na sensação, na atratividade de produtos de tabaco e na atração de grupos específicos, por exemplo, como negros, mulheres, é, que a indústria, é, através dos anos, tem se utilizado desses aditivos para é, é, atraí-los para marcas específicas e, e determinados padrões de consumo. E, bom, tem... Mas o trabalho é excelente. Obrigado, Sim, obrigado, Carolina. Bem. A gente só tem a agradecer e com mensagem de esperança a gente termina a live de hoje. Muito obrigada. Thank you so much, Professor Glenn. It was very um, so, so much information that we needed to hear and the last message of hope was pretty um, it fit. It fit well. Give us hope. It, uh... Well, thank you. You give us, give me hope too. It's like I keep telling people here, why can't you be more like Brazil? <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you Professor Glenn. Thank, thank you for having me. Tchau, tchau. Muito obrigada, pessoal, pela assistência. E corre para inscrever. <laughs>